So what are y'all doing over the summer? Well, me personally, uh, I think I'm planning on becoming literate. Yeah, me too. Literacy is so important. Wait, you, you guys can't read? Aren't you professors? No, Lance, I can read, but I'm talking about 21st century literacies. What? Well, I like, think kind of everything is a literacy, Lance. I mean, when I watch TV or get on social media, that's media, I'm practicing media literacy. If I fix my computer because it's broken, that's technological literacy. And you know what? Like, I think that if I tie my shoes really well, like really well, I think I'm engaging in some sort of shoelace literacy. So, I, you know, if I do a thing, I think it could be a literacy. Yeah. Like when I multitask, that's multimodal literacies. Do y'all even know what literacy means? No. Does it? thought it mean to learn. means like anything, right? Like life, life is literacy, right? Is that, right. we read the world? Doing anything is literacy. When I am in the world, I'm literate in that space. It, it's embodied. Yeah. Okay. Well, according to, you know, if I were to look in a dictionary, it would tell us that literacy is the ability to read, write, and understand written language. So I think we need to be a little bit more precise about how we use the term. As our little vignette uh, 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 illustrates, we're going to be talking about the literacy metaphor uh, with a particular emphasis on media literacy and the implications of thinking about uh, media education as a literacy. And so just jumping into it here, so education has long been concerned with literacy as the traditional definition of, of reading and writing. Um, but Come the mid 20th century, uh, the proliferation of, of electronic technologies led to starting to rethink um, some of those skills and it led to calls for media literacy. So, uh, which is generally defined as teaching students to access, evaluate and create messages in various electronic forms. Um, in recent decades, that metaphorical extension of literacy has proliferated. Um, into uh, many different things as we just kind of illustrated um, in social studies, the, uh, we've got many literacies that we talk about from civic literacy to historical literacy, um, but media literacy has been a mainstay for, for decades. And so uh, we're gonna talk about that here and I'm gonna read the NCSS position statements uh, definition of media literacy from 2016 says that the core of learning is literacy, the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and produce communication. Media literacy expands the traditional conception of literacy to include the forms of communication that dominate the lives of our students. If our students are to be literate, we must teach them the skills and habits of literacy for print and non-print media messages. So in this, and I say NCSS, by the way, is the National Council for the Social Studies, should explain that. In their conception, Understanding electronic media is conceptualized in terms of literacy, the ability to interpret messages. So our question here is whether literacy is the best metaphor um, for talking about an education uh, surrounding media or a media education. And so we're gonna jump into that. Um, the grounding we use, the theoretical grounding is uh, Lakoff and Johnson and their book, uh, Metaphors to Live By. And so in Metaphors to Live By, um, Lakoff and Johnson talk about, uh, they argue that we make meaning at a fundamental level uh, using metaphor. And so what we do is we take a source domain, which this is an area that we understand and that 
we have a lot of good experience with, and we map it on, I'm using a metaphor there explaining it, we map it onto a target domain. So a kind of a novel new area that's less understood. And so this is what we've seen with the literacy process. We understand literacy and when these new things came along, we started mapping that metaphor onto these new experiences. So this is a necessary process. We, uh, according to Lakoff and Johnson, if we accept their theory, and of course we, we do, um, this is a necessary process for us to understand phenomena. So there isn't anything wrong with doing this, um, but there are implications for doing it. Uh, if you stick with a narrow set of metaphors to describe a new phenomena, you may end up ultimately limiting your understanding of them. And so that's the concern here that we have with uh, the, these metaphorical extensions of literacy. So we'll talk a little bit about the reading process here. So reading in many ways is a private individual experience, right? People read at their own pace. You got to focus in order to do it. You minimize external stimuli. A lot of times, you know, you want to go to a quiet place, you know, a library or a room that's isolated. Um, it's an intensive process. It requires years of training. Um, so when we apply literacy uncritically to electronic media, our argument is that you end up imposing a comprehensive centric framework based upon that decoding focus of literacy um, on the experiences people have with electronic media technologies, which are very different experiences. And so the focus of those exercises then becomes the decoding of meaning in those forms. So the problem with that is that the sensory motor experiences, the, the experiential engagement with electronic media is often very different um, from print media. And so, for example, if we just think about television, no training is required. Uh, the, you know, the material simply washes over you. You can kind of watch TV at any age and get something out of it. Where reading, of course, you have to kind of, you have to learn it. The new media and stuff like that has altered some of these variables. If we think about the kind of the more bi-directional engagement of new media. Um, the way we say it is they remediate both print and screen, right? So if we think about new technologies, there's, you know, there's print involved as well. But the sensory focus, we argue, is centered on what we call the telegraphic discourse of television. And so it's, a, it's still this multi-sensory engagement that washes over you, even though it may require some traditional literacy skills within it. Um, and so the cent we argue the central focus of most liter media literacy instruction involves interpreting and comprehending uh, representations within media or, or the content of media. So there is, of course, utility in this approach. We have to do this. This is something that's important. But with screens, the sensory motor system of the human body, we, there's kind of a, what we call a, a, a pseudo intimacy that's very different from reading. Um, watching something, people tend to respond as if they were actually in the event which creates a much different kind of emotional engagement, right? And so that kind of, as our society has moved from print to the screen to get its news and things like that, um, that's a big part of, I, I would argue, our political polarization in the culture. Um, screen technologies don't move at their own, don't, we don't control the pace, generally speaking. You can, this changes a little bit with new media, but not a whole lot. Um, we don't control the pace of what's coming at us, so then there's less time for analytical reflection. Um, and so there's an encouragement of more of an instantaneous emotional reaction um, as opposed to an analytical one uh, that's kind of emphasized in the, uh, in the more individualized process of reading. So literacy metaphor asks students and teachers to attend to decoding the message, but typically diverts our attention from the particular dimensions of the media form itself. In other words, we take the medium out of media education. Wow, Lance, that is a lot to take in. I mean, you just, I'm, now I'm thinking about how different it is to read something, right? When I have the time to do it and to watch a movie. And recently I was thinking about the movie Forrest Gump. It's a movie I watched in the 90s. I was a, a young adolescent, right? Making my way into the world still learning history and the, here comes along a movie that gives this vision of American history. And I didn't know a lot about, for example, the Black Panthers, which show up in a couple spots in the movie. Um, and when you watch Forrest Gump, you get a real Im 
a negative impression of the Black Panthers, but I, it never registered to me until years later when someone pointed it out in an article that they wrote. They wrote an article that talked about how Forrest Gump um, really had an anti-Black racist depiction of the Black Panthers. But I guess when I watched it, it kind of washed over me in a way that was so uncritical, right, that I didn't really notice, for example, that it was implied that the Black Panthers don't care about violence against women because it happened in front of them and none of them said anything. It was uh, the characterization of them as, as angry and they would yell at anyone who came in their vicinity, right? Um, angry Black men, right, was stereotypical. But if I had read the depiction, I might have seen it actually as more absurd. Um, and been able to critique it. But when I watched it, I didn't realize it till years later. And so I wonder how I kind of even that it imprinted, you know, in my mind somewhere, almost subconsciously, that negative image of Black Panthers in, in Forrest Gump. And so is that kind of what you're talking about, the difference between if I'd maybe been able to, to reflect on it and think about it more if I'd read it than if I watched it? So, or... Dan, is this when we are talking about these new literacies, maybe you just need to be able to be more literate when you're watching a movie with media literacy. Is that what is that what we're talking about, Lance, or is there a different way of thinking about that? Well, I definitely think of, you know, if we want to think about comprehending the messages there, right, um, then we could call that media literacy. But uh, I think we need to also kind of be aware of the way that we tend to not, as Dan noted, not really reflect upon that. Um, and of course you can not reflect on your reading as well. So, I mean, we, we need to be aware of, you can, you can be a, you know, a poor reader and not think a lot about what you're reading. Um, but the, the form discourages thinking about those kind of things that are washing over you quickly, right? So the Black Panther example uh, can easily kind of brush by. Now, how impactful is that on a kid if there's no kind of deconstruction of it? Who knows? But then, you, of course, you think about the thousands of times that maybe negative portrayals of African-Americans come across your screen, right? Um, and you start to maybe develop a bias or something like that, and you don't know where it even came from, right? Because it doesn't necessarily fit with your experience. Well, so interrogating those things, of course, is part of media literacy, but being aware of the form itself um, and its tendency to do these things is something that um, media literacy certainly does, and people who work in media literacy are aware of these things and talk about them. Um, but we tend not to talk about the form itself and the, how the form privileges um, those misunderstandings in a way that's, that's problematic. Does that make sense, Dan? Yeah, that, that does help a bit. And um, I just... The thing I worry about is, am I realistically going to reflect in the same ways on movies and critique them, right? Even think about, I'm, I'm not going to stop it usually, right? How often do you stop a movie in the middle? Whereas you right. often stop while you're reading a book. And so I just, I guess you're, you're right that we still can take these in negatively, but what it does is nudges us, the mediums nudge us towards certain ways of interacting with, with the, what the message is with which we're looking at or reading. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll jump into our next point there um, where we kind of talk about new literacy studies, the new London group and stuff like that, which um, just to kind of point out that our argument is distinct from these folks. So the, uh, these folks are making, to the best of my understanding, they're making a sociocultural argument about media messages and about the fact that uh, there isn't this kind of universal uh, understanding that can be had when one you know, takes in a piece of, uh, of, when one reads something or watches something or what have you. Um, they argue that literacy is a practice with ideological dimensions that are uh, so socially and culturally rooted we agree with this assessment, but they also make a case for expanding the conception of literacy to include multimodal text outside of print. This is where we draw a distinction because they use the term literacy to describe their process of understanding things like screen media, they may unwittingly limit their ability to recognize how the screen media has experiential dimensions that are uh, fundamentally distinct. Uh, from the analytic process of, of print literacy, regardless of the socio-cultural socio particulars involved. 
One can acknowledge that the interpretation of messages will vary by culture and context, by also recognizing the human perceptual system is focal in identifying and interpreting stimuli, regardless of sociocultural factors. We do not agree that every way of being, knowing, and interacting with the world should be classified as some form of literacy, as literacy scholars often claim. Surely not every scholar and educator is calling everything a literacy, even though Dan and I were joking around with that at the very beginning of this talk. We do think that a lot of this work is very important, but some scholars aren't using the media literacy term, or at least they're not foregrounding it as their primary term. Um, and I think sometimes that's appropriate to determining on, de depending on the medium that they're talking about. So for example, students face a real challenge in navigating the internet. How do we, how do we figure out how to um, be, re be able to understand what we're seeing, be understand where we're getting to? And the internet is very different than print literacy historically, right? Which was, you would purchase a book, the book you may have got, or you may have checked out a book from like a library. And there's a lot of like quality control that should be happening there, right? You have publishers who have to decide what to print. Then you have librarians who may decide what to shelf, and then you may have somebody who, that the, a librarian who can help you pick out the book. And so there's all these things. And then when you get the book, you generally have can figure out who the author is and decide if you want to read the book. Well, the internet moves much faster. You use search engines that give an array of options, and it's so easy and, and low cost for people to put up websites, right? Um, and so then you have these search engines that potentially lead you all places. There's hyperlinks on all kinds of pages. And before you know it, you don't even know where you're at in the internet. And so some scholars have started to research that. And so particularly recently, the Stanford History Education Group developed what they called civic online reasoning, right? So you notice they did not use the literacy metaphor as part of this. And what they said is you have to actually be able to think about what you're doing online. And one of the important skills, which I would not consider a literacy in the traditional sense is lateral reading, right? Instead of just reading pages horizontally, you actually sometimes need to, if you're on a website, you don't know the site, you need to get off that site, go to another one and check, see what you can learn about that site to determine, should I even stay there? Uh, in, in kind of coordination and kind of supporting some of that research, M Michael Caulfield uh, has developed the SIFT method and SIFT stands for stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, and then trace claims, quotes, and media to the original context. And basically his main argument is that we're on the internet, traditional media literacy would ask you when you get to a web page to analyze it, to spend time decoding it, to spend time looking for bias or figuring out if it's propaganda. But if you end up on like a white supremacist page, right, that someone linked in some kind of message board, he would say the most valuable way of approaching that is not to analyze it, because if we have an attention economy online, then you do not want to give attention to that. And there's so many websites that your atten where your attention goes is important. So you actually need to be able to quickly, within 15 to 30 seconds, realistically, identify where whether you should even look on that source or stay on that source. And you should quickly be able to say, I'm not going to retweet this because I don't know the source. I'm not going to stay on this website. And that's an actual skill that's very different from literacy because the internet as a media environment is very different from books or even just an individual web page. And so teaching students those skills requires thinking a bit differently, just like thinking we have to think about the medium when we watch Forrest Gump and recognize that while it's useful to have students critique Forrest Gump in a class, it's unrealistic that they're gonna do it when they're watching a movie at home. Thanks, Dan. That really, I think, helps uh, think about the the ways that it's not a metaphor maybe or different terms that help us think about making sense of in media spaces. Um, and I think about the ways that Shag uses reasoning instead of literacy, um, which I appreciate, but I also wonder if that misses some of the emotive nature of media as well. And that SIFT kind of gets there in recognizing that there's an attention to this, right? So there, that is, that there is an emotive piece and your attention is your currency. And so maybe interrupting that and pausing it um, is another way to think about this. So it seems like even though the definition of literacy has been expanded beyond original conceptions of decoding print and making meaning of it, 
Um, and we now have ways of making more meaning in, in, within the world. I wonder if the metaphor itself might still constrain our thinking as Lance talked about earlier. Um, media or technologies, they involve this sensory and emotive experience. And maybe they could be captured better through a different metaphor. Maybe we could think differently about our pedagogies, for instance, the SIFT method, if we weren't thinking about these as literacies to, as to make meaning, but instead something else. Um, so I know that we've talked about using media ecology as a jumping off point for that. Lance, what are some ways that you've been thinking through this? Yeah, so I definitely agree that, you know, we need to find new ways to talk about talk about the experiential dimensions, right, of electronic forms. And, and I definitely think, you know, new terminology may be useful, right? Maybe using media literacy less and kind of talking about media education or, uh, or maybe new terms that we haven't thought of necessarily here. Um, so some of the ways that we thought about to kind of explore those experiential dimensions um, is uh, figure ground analysis. And this was first proposed by uh, Marshall McLuhan and some of his colleagues, including his son. Um, they pulled the idea of figure ground analysis from the Gestalt uh, psychologists from the early 20th century. Um, and this describes how human perception changes depending upon uh, the environment that one is in. So what you're focused on is the figure, the foreground, um, and everything else is the ground or, you know, what we call, generally call the background. Um, and so, I mean, so this suggests a, a pedagogy of perception, in which students learn to identify and reflect upon their perceptions with exposure to various environments. And of course, in order to have that conception, we have to think of media as environments, which kind of brings in the media ecology uh, metaphor that, um, that Marie just mentioned. So if we think about this in the realm of screen media, one obvious thing can be to kind of to, to isolate the sensory dimensions of the screen, to kind of to, to, to separate them out. So if you think about something like spoken language or music, you can isolate those features, listen to them. Um, I use this with students with commercials because it's a very succinct uh, form that can be kind of, a you can analyze from beginning to end in a relatively quick amount of time. Um, you know, you can mute the sound and kind of watch the way the images wash over you. And you, basically you can impose kind of a reflective analytic, uh, uh, stance on what is very much an experiential, uh, uh, non-analytic experience, um, you know, in the moment. So Lance, so maybe one way we could, a teacher could teach about that Forrest Gump scene is to actually give students a transcript of the scene initially, maybe have them watch the scene without any audio to see like what the camera work, what the lighting and things are doing, and then maybe have them just listen to the audio. So by separating those parts, I'd maybe be able to understand not only the, the, the broader perception, but like how the movie makers created that scene. I'll be able to start to unfold it in ways that can help me think about how media, the, the, the screen media, um, sometimes there's, I, I'm, only, I'm only getting the emotional parts and not getting able to analytically see like how they're trying to shape the experience and, and convey some kind of message. Another figure ground example would be to uh, transpose content from one medium to another to kind of to recognize the difference in the experience of it. So um, an obvious thing would be typing out and you just kind of gave this example um, with the Forrest Gump thing, but typing out the spoken words of a commercial, um, you can transcribe a commercial very quickly. Um, generally speaking, there's not a lot of text. Um, and, you know, if you read that, it, it can become in isolation from the images, it can become very clear how central the images are to kind of our meaning making processes of the commercial, right? And that we tend, to, again, not to really um, notice unless there's something in that commercial that really jumps out at us, right? So, the, so it becomes the ground, but unless, you know, there's something in particular there. Um, and, and that can kind of bring that stuff to figure how focal it is in kind of making meaning for us that we don't even realize. Um, another way uh, to think about, and this is something that's still 
we haven't fully developed, but this idea of tetrads, another thing. McLuhan talked about, um, they developed these, this is this kind of, uh, their argument, they call them the laws of media, is that every media technology, every media or technology, in a lot of ways we use that simultaneously as, as McLuhan did, can be an, examined for four features. What it enhances, what it obsolesces or makes less relevant, what it retrieves, and what it reverses. And so um, the example we use in the paper here is the camera. It enhances aggression when pictures are unwanted. Um, it obsolesces privacy. You think about the paparazzi and things like that. And well, you can think of a lot worse examples in uh, today's culture. Um, it retrieves the past and it reverses or flips into the public domain when it's pushed to its extreme. Um, these are really complex. They're hard to deal with. Um, but I do think the, I, certainly the idea of what is intensified um, and what's obsolesced, those are fairly simple if you think about um, those for new technologies, if you think about the, you know, the, the CD, you know, um, you know, intense or digital music intensifying exposure to music, obsolescing CD, so on and so forth. Um, and of course, there's complexities there because McLuhan talks about when something is obsolesced, it turns into an art form. So we can kind of think about vinyl and how that's kind of come back into um, vogue. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, those are a fun thing to play with. And we're kind of working on um, how that might be able to be used in a classroom. Activity that we're discussing are, are superhero extensions. They kind of build on the tetrads, right? And Marshall McLuhan contended that technologies are kind of like prosthetics or they're like extensions of our bodies and our senses, right? So like easy cars replace our feet, right, to, to get somewhere. Um, but, but also what happens is technology also amputate uh, uh, our physical attributes or our senses too. So this metaphor is a powerful way to see how technologies um, are trade-offs, right, but also how they change us, right, that we become used to cars and we think in terms of cars when we think of travel and going places. And so one way we could potentially have students think about that is to have them choose a technology, right? They could choose something like a, a, a smartphone and then create and then make that technology into a superhero, right? So say, so it may be smartphone, you may have smartphones for hands or for one of your hands, right? Replacing it. And so you come up with a superhero name, whatever it is, smartphoneum, right? You draw the superhero with the technology as the extension of their body. And you can author a comic story that explains the origin story of the superhero. Where did it come from? And explain what senses that technology extends and explain what the superhero also loses. You kind of can think of that as their flaws or their kryptonite, right? That they, the things that they lose. Um, and you could even have their rival be the technology that they're replacing. Now with smartphones, that's many technologies, but probably most prominently phones. Um, and so earlier versions of phones, uh, uh, you want to go back further, you could just talk about like, you know, oral culture and communication. And so having students write these could then lead to discussions about how what we gain and lose with technologies in our life, which we oftentimes don't think about uh, technologies that deeply, particularly what we lose with new technologies and how they change us. One last strategy that we're going to put forward is asking students techno-skeptical questions. And, and I, I developed this with uh, Scott Metzger for a different project, but we ended up using Neil Postman's 1998 talk about technological change to, to just develop five questions. And I won't go into depth about them, but I'll share the five questions. Uh, one question is, what does society give up for the benefits of technology? Uh, the second question is, who is harmed and who benefits from the technology? There's always winners and losers. The third question is, what does the technology need? So this focuses on the biases of technology, like what does the technology want you to do? Cars need space, for example, to park. Um, fourth one is, uh, what are the unintended or unexpected changes caused by the technology? Right, Technologies oftentimes cause other things to happen that we don't anticipate. For example, they spread our cities out and now people get less exercise because of cars. That may not have been something on uh, Henry Ford's mind when he started mass production of, of automobiles. And then lastly, uh, educators can ask, why is it difficult to imagine our world without the technology, which helps us think through um, you know, that these technologies are not a natural part of our world, but in fact, they, they are things that have imposed different ways of being in the world. And so all those questions are meant to, to dive deeper into the trade-offs and the downsides of technology that we often don't think about and to disrupt notions of technological progress that often pervade our society.
Well, um, I'm thinking about what my superhero trait might be here. And I'm wondering if it would be like a Zoom attachment to perhaps my eyes. But regardless, I feel like all of us here have definitely shown mastery in our presentation literacies and our video conferencing literacies. Yes, I, I agree, Marie, wholeheartedly. And in fact, I would like to invoke my gratitude literacies to tell you I appreciate that comment. Really?